Hi, I'm Jeremy, the Zoo Nerd, coming to you live from my backyard in Los Angeles, California. How are you doing today? I hope you're well. I hope you're happy. I hope you're healthy. We had a nice little rain shower this morning, so it's a, a little bit wet and humid here today, um, but we'll see if we get more rain or not. It says no, but it looks like we might, so we'll see how that goes. Today we're going to do something um, kind of fun. We're going to talk about uh, some monkeys, and since it's Monday, I thought it could be Monkey Monday uh, for the next little bit with Critter Chat, and I'll talk about a different group of monkeys each week on Mondays. Um, so let me know if you like that idea, and if so, I'll continue it. But um, My zoo career actually began working with monkeys, so monkeys have always had a very special place in my heart and in my experience. And uh, one of those species is part of the group that we're going to talk about today in Critter Chat. Today we're talking about the marmosets and tamarins. And together, these two little groups of monkeys make up a group of monkeys called the caltrichids. Uh, that's a big sciencey word. Um, but they are a group of the smallest size of monkeys, and they live throughout Central and South America from about Costa Rica down to southern Brazil and Bolivia. Um, so they love the rainforest. They love to live in places with lots of good tree growth and they spend almost their entire life in the trees. It's very rare that they will come to the ground out in the wild and even in zoos, they don't really come to the ground too much. So they like to be up in the trees, moving around looking for food up in that uh, area. So the difference between the two, I'm going to kind of talk about them in general as one group, even though there is some differences between what is a marmoset and what is a tamarind. Um, tamarinds tend to be a, just a little bit bigger and tamarinds, they have a different teeth structure is the, the big difference between the two groups. Um, tamarinds technically have longer canines. Those are the pointy teeth in the kind of on the edge of the front. Uh, we have canine teeth. Um, things like dogs and cats have canine teeth that are very pronounced. So the big teeth on like a, a tiger, those are canines. Um, so tamarins have slightly longer canine teeth than their other teeth. Uh, marmosets, they're kind of all the same length across. And like I said, tamarins tend to be a little bit bigger, um, though that's not always true. Some species are kind of overlap in size. Um, roughly there are 10 kinds of tamarins, although some people say there's more. Most of those get classified as like a subspecies or even a color phase of an existing of one of those 10. And 22 species of marmosets. Of those, about a third to a half are somewhere on the endangered scale of critically endangered, um, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, or least concern. Um, so they kind of range throughout that span. Uh, I'm going to focus a little more on some of the endangered species because one, those are the ones I know more about. Two, those are the ones you're most likely to see in the zoo. And there's some really cool uh, conservation stories associated with them. For starters though, these little monkeys, they uh, kind of are squirrel sized and they kind of move like a squirrel, um, kind of running along the branches of trees. Um, they don't really... Uh, jump super far distances like some of the bigger monkeys do and unlike some of the other monkeys in South America they cannot hold on with their tails their tails are kind of more for a balance thing their tails don't hold anything they can't pick things up with their tails um, also their hands are a bit different than a lot of the other monkey species uh, their thumbs don't really work as well as like ours do as far as picking things up uh, so their dexterity or their use of their hands is not nearly as good as most other monkey species. And then something that I find very interesting, they don't have nails. So on us, we have nice fingernails. It's kind of a flat surface, uh, kind of comes to a, a very rounded edge. Most primates or most monkeys and apes, I should say, have a nail, a fingernail. Um, lemurs kind of have more of a claw and some of the other um, more primitive primates, and marmosets and tamarins have claws instead of nails. Um, that's really important to them. Uh, as they climb in the trees, they're just little guys, but it helps them to be able to climb straight up a tree very easily. They use their claws to, 
to kind of uh, help grab into the bark as they climb. But it's also very, very important to them for their diet or for what they eat out in the wild. Because all marmosets and tamarinds love to eat tree sap or tree gum. And the way they get that is they use these little claws on their fingers to kind of cut a little or scratch a little hole in the tree to where they can lick the sap or the tree gum out of the tree. Uh, so they're big time gum chewers, I guess. Uh, but it's not quite as uh, thick of a substance as chewing gum. It's more like kind of a maple syrup kind of thing or somewhere between chewing gum and maple syrup. Let's put it that way. Um, so these guys are very small. Uh, the biggest ones weigh maybe three pounds. So they are very little uh, animals. Um, the very smallest one and the smallest monkey in the world is called a pygmy marmoset. I have seen them in a couple of different zoos. Um, they are itty bitty. They are just little guys uh, weighing in at 120 grams at their biggest or four ounces. So that means it would take four of them to equal one pound. Um, so they are absolutely little tiny guys. Um, they have them at the San Diego Zoo or they used to, they were in their children's zoo, which is currently under construction and has been for a while. So I believe they still have them. I don't know if they're on exhibit there. Um, and the zoo there is closed right now anyway, but they do have some information about them on their website. Um, so uh, most of the marmosets are, and are a little bit smaller than most of the tamarinds. Um, the marmosets and tamarinds typically weigh between like one pound and two pounds. Some get up to about th almost three pounds, but they are still pretty small as far as the monkeys go. So they kind of move like a squirrel and they kind of sound like birds. So they make a lot of like squeaks and chirping sounds. Uh, but that being said, one species, the cotton top tamarind, which is the, the type that was pictured earlier today, on both Facebook and Instagram, the cotton top tamarinds, they have identified 38 different vocalizations for just that one little tiny, tiny kind of monkey, um, which is pretty impressive. They are a little guy, but they, um, scientists usually equate uh, vocalizations or language with um, brain power, with being smart. And so even though they're little, they make a lot of different sounds. Those sounds have meanings. And so they have language. Uh, and they are definitely smart, even though they're small. So I said that they like to eat the sap or the gum from trees. They also will eat the flowers. Um, they love to eat flowers and they especially love to eat insects. So even though they're small, uh, they will hunt other animals and anything smaller than them is fair game. So if they find little frogs, if they find little lizards, if they find little birds, if they find other little mammals like a mouse or something or baby squirrel, um, they will try to eat any of that, definitely. Um, and that's kind of true across the range with all of these little monkeys. They, uh, they are small, but they are mighty. Uh, they do love some fruit, um, but the gum and the sap is really an important part of their diet and uh, something that is kind of harder to replicate in a zoo setting, um, but they have found ways to do that to get them their proper nutrition. Um, marmosets and tamarinds are diurnal, which means they're active during the daytime. Um, so right now would be a great time of day if you were in the jungle to see them. Um, they are also arboreal or tree dwelling. So they very rarely come to the ground. Um, so we talked a little bit about their language. They can make a variety of different sounds. Um, some of those are able to be understood by other monkey species and other animals in general, including their alarm calls. Um, they have specific sounds for different types of predators that may be in the forest that would cause some uh, threats to them. So they would have a specific sound for say a snake. They would have a specific sound for a bird of prey. They would have a specific sound for a jungle cat. Um, and they can help communicate with their group um, to so everybody knows that there's a predator around and then they can kind of explain where that animal is and how they need to move away from it. So with marmosets and tamarinds, their social structure is a bit different than other monkeys. Most monkeys live in big groups called troops, 
where it's multiple parents and multiple babies and it's kind of a big multi-generational family that lives together. Marmosets and tamarins live in a tighter group than that. They live in like um, what we would think of more as a traditional family where there are typically two parents, a mom and a dad, um, and then their, their offspring. So they will sometimes um, have not only their most recent offspring, but their offspring before that. Um, when I started my zoo career, I worked with golden lion tamarins were one of the first species I, of monkey that I worked with. And in the group that, that they had at Utah's Hogle Zoo when I was there, they had 13 individuals. So there was a mom and a dad and then 11 of their children. Um, so that was kind of a big family. That's the biggest group of um, a tamarind or marmoset group that I have seen. And we got to 13 there at that time because they had just had twins and the oldest two were about to leave. So it went from 13 down to 11 and then um, the next uh, oldest group left shortly after that. With marmosets and tamarinds, twins is common. Um, so it's almost always twins. Uh, sometimes it's a single birth. On a rare occasion, it's triplets. Triplets, they don't always usually survive. And even if, with twins, uh, the risk of infant mortality or death when they're babies um, is pretty high. Uh, but one thing that's really cute about the species is even though the adults are tiny, the babies are even smaller and from the moment they are born they are covered with fur they have their eyes open and they ride on their moms or their dad's backs immediately um so they don't really uh they'll kind of have a little nest or a little house where they sleep at night in the forest that's usually like a little uh hole in a tree that they'll kind of pad with some other leaves and and things to make it warmer and softer um but then they are out with the babies all day long. They keep the babies with them. They don't uh, leave them at home to go hunt for food. So uh, it's really cute to see baby marmosets or tamarins because they're riding along on their mom or their dad's back. Um, in the group I worked with uh, when I first started my zoo career, they, uh, they had newborns like the third week I was there and the dad was doing most of the carrying, although he was a little old man and his hair was starting to fall out. So he would carry one of the babies and then the mom would carry the other and then they would switch off so she could feed him. And then after a while, his hair kept getting thinner and thinner. And so some of the older siblings started to help out. Um, and once the babies get a little more comfortable moving around, the older kids definitely start carrying uh, their younger siblings around too, which is also really good training for them uh, for them to someday be parents of their own and help carry the babies around. Uh, so typically out in the forest, in the wild, you would see maybe like six to 10 of them in a family group. Uh, the fact that we worked with 13 for a while uh, was pretty unusual. And the dad was starting to be a little more aggressive to those older kids telling them it was time to go. And they moved on to other zoos. So let's talk a little bit about their home. So they live in the rainforest in South America. And as you may suspect, um, deforestation or cutting down the trees is a huge problem for them. Uh, it's estimated that there's 10 species of tamarins and 22 species of marmosets. They don't really all overlap. They each kind of have their own geographic region of where that species lives. So some of them that are not as threatened tend to be like deeper in the forest and further away from cities. And some of the most threatened live really close to big, big cities in uh, Central and South America. So one of those is called the golden lion tamarins. They're bright yellowish orange color uh, as they get older or some individuals tend to almost be like blonde in color, like uh, yellowish white. Um, they live on the coastal rainforest of Brazil. I believe it's near Sao Paulo, but it might be between Sao Paulo and Rio, but it's just a little tiny patch of forest right on the Atlantic coast of uh, Brazil. And those are huge cities in Brazil. There's tons of people there. There's millions and millions of people in those cities. And as those cities continue to grow and as people keep moving further and further out and needing more places to grow food to feed all those people, 
uh, the forest has been cut down and reduced to help grow crops. And that is a huge problem for many of the lion, of the marmosets and tamarinds, and particularly the golden lion tamarind. So in the 1970s, uh, they did a census as to how many they could find, and they could only find about 200 left in the wild forest. Um, so they started a, a breeding program and they involved many, many U.S. zoos um, that did a lot of really great work. It was spearheaded by uh, the National Zoo, which is part of the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. And they uh, developed a very uh, specific strategy on how to breed them in captivity and then how to get them back to the forest. So National Zoo got really creative with how they were letting them uh, live at the zoo in that they knew that some of these monkeys would be returning to the wild down in Brazil. They wanted them to have actual life skills of moving through large trees and avoiding things like birds that might be a threat to them and watching out for other predators and also finding shelter and finding food. So they would put their food in different places every day, but they actually let the monkeys roam free at the zoo in Washington, D.C. So they, they had a section of trees that uh, were kind of isolated so they couldn't get out of the zoo. They know the monkeys don't come to the ground. So they knew this big section of trees, they didn't go near any trees outside the zoo. They'd be safe up in these trees and they would put their food around in different places. So the monkeys had to work to find their food throughout and they would put them outside and let them kind of roam free in this little uh, span of forest inside the zoo um, during this, the warmer months. So they'd let them out in the spring and they'd bring them back in in the fall. But every night they have these little, uh, kind of like a birdhouse, a little wooden house where they would sleep up in the trees. And then uh, when it was time to bring them inside for the winter time, they would just make sure that they were sleeping and a zookeeper would sneak up there on a ladder and close a little door and that would kind of close them in their little house and then they could just take the whole house in and put it inside their building for the winter months. Well, that came into a lot of uh, handy when they decided to actually reintroduce the monkeys to a uh, protected forest out in Brazil. They were able to just close the door, keep them in their little house, then put them into a transport crate, get them on airplanes, send them down to Brazil and release them out into the jungle. And once they released them out into the jungle, they put those little houses up there for a little while, but they knew that they would eventually kind of disperse and find natural places to sleep as well. And it worked out very well. So in the 1970s, there were about 200 of the golden lion tamarinds left. And with many zoos help over about a 30 year period in um, right around 2003, I think they got delisted from critically endangered to endangered, which still is pretty scary, but there's about 2,500 of them out in the forest of Brazil today. And many of them can be traced genetically back to those zoo monkeys uh, at the National Zoo and many other zoos that help participate in the breeding program. So uh, we mentioned deforestation is a big threat to many of these little monkeys and also because they are little and they're cute, the pet trade is also a huge uh, problem for many of them. And although most primates or monkeys and associated animals are illegal to own in most states in the US now, the United States is not as big of an issue, but there are still some states that allow it and some monkeys still exist as pets in some states and it is uh that is a very big problem in the world today uh, many countries still allow monkeys to be pets and many of these little species particularly are sought after for the pet trade and often caught it in the wild um, for that reason so another species that uh, has been going through that recently is the cotton top tamarins that's the one i posted a photo of later earlier today they're super cute with those big puffy white heads um, and uh, kind of dark lower head and, and kind of a gray color face. Uh, they're super great uh, monkeys to work with. And I had the experience of working with them during my time at the Los Angeles Zoo when I was training to be a zookeeper there. 
Um, that's when that photo was taken of a cotton top tamarind. But I also did some work uh, during my time in Phoenix, uh, helping educate people about uh, the different threats that primates face. And one of those monkeys that I did a lot of research at that time was a cotton top tamarind because they are critically endangered and it was estimated that they were down to just a couple hundred left in their home range. Now they live in Colombia and they live not far away from a big city in Colombia called Cartagena. And Cartagena is millions of people. And if you go on the outskirts of Cartagena to a little uh, village right on the edge of the city area, and then if you take a little 20 minute hike, you're in the forest where cotton top tamarinds live. And so it's a very, uh, precious forest that also has been destroyed quite a bit. Columbia built a big dam in that area and that flooded a lot of the area of the forest as well as it's close to one of their biggest cities. Many of the trees have been cut down to grow farm uh, products that people need to eat and so that has also caused a problem. But there's a, a program that's designed that has done a lot of good for cotton top tamarinds and they are our special shout out today called Proyecto Titi. That's Spanish words for protect the monkey, um, Proyecto Titi. And I don't speak Spanish, so I'm sure I'm butchering the way that's said. Uh, has done a lot of great work in helping the people in that little village on the edge of Cartagena respect and support the cotton top tamarind. They've also enlisted the help of the local community to help protect that rainforest and the monkeys and other animals that live there. Today in that little village, they have a special uh, cotton top tamarind uh, monkey day where they celebrate that monkey. They have a little parade. The kids dress up like the monkeys. They all have little hats that look like the monkey's hair. Um, they've also helped the some of the kids uh, one of the problems in that forest is it's also very polluted with a lot of human trash. And so they've gathered a lot of like plastic bags that they have then woven to make a uh, like shopping bag that's more durable, that's more than a one-time use. And Proyecto TT has actually helped uh, to sell them. And Proyecto TT has done a lot of great work for about 25 years. They've been working with the cotton top tamarinds but they kind of got adopted by an even bigger conservation organization, and that is the Disney Conservation Fund. Now, as we talk about conservation and if we talk about uh, people who have some money, the Disney Conservation Fund is one of those top tier places. They have millions of dollars that they uh, set aside from people who visit their Animal Kingdom Park in Florida, and also some of their other money-making um, things that Disney does throughout the year, particularly the Disney nature films that they've created, which if you haven't ever seen those, I highly encourage you to check those out. But some of the profits from those films also go to support many conservation programs. And Disney has actually given, I think it's over $150 million um, to conservation. So they've done a lot of really great work. And Proyecto TT is one of the benefactors of that money in helping to um, help the cotton top tamarinds. So I mentioned that um, I worked with a couple of the different marmoset and tamarind species. Uh, at Hogel Zoo, I worked with golden lion tamarinds. I'll put a photo or two up of those uh, later today and see if I can find um, some video of them because they're super cute. Uh, they also make really great sounds. Uh, one of my favorites is they kind of make this high-pitched bird-like sound if they get mad at you. Um, so working as a zookeeper, they would often scream at me when I was new because they didn't know who I was. They can identify people really quickly, um, especially at Hogel Zoo. I was the only guy who worked in, with those monkeys. So some of them either really liked me or really hated me. I'll tell you another story about a, a monkey that absolutely loved me at that when I get to uh, his monkey group. But uh, also at the Los Angeles Zoo, I've worked with cotton top tamarinds, golden lion tamarinds, and also Jeffrey's marmosets. I'll see if I can find some photos of those monkeys that I worked with there. Uh, really fun to take care of. Always uh, very exciting to see them moving about and just absolutely quick little buggers running around and very exciting to watch. 
I hope you've enjoyed what I've shared with you today about marmosets and tamarinds. I'll be sharing more later today on the Facebook profile. And as always, I will upload the full episode of this on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. So feel free to watch and check out, share, subscribe with any of your family or friends who may find this information interesting. And until tomorrow, be safe, be happy, be healthy. Bye.